Good morning, everybody. My name is Rocky Brockway, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, this is a really uh, competitive time slot, and there's a lot of other really interesting talks as well. So thanks for uh, thanks for coming out here. I work for uh, Black Box Network Services. Uh, if you are at all familiar with them, you should probably remember the old catalog that was giant and and sold uh, uh, lots of cables and and things of that nature. Um, I'm the Information Security and Business Risk Director for Black Box. Um, and for me, the geek started really, really early. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not really going to go back and do much of my background. I've been in information security for 22 years, 23 years now, I believe. <clears throat> I got a really lucky start, though. Um, uh, my senior project, I went to Case Western Reserve in, in, in Cleveland, and my senior project ended up being um, working for this organization that um, was founded by a guy named Dr. Peter Tippett. And he's, I guess, widely credited as having written the first antivirus program. Uh, so he had this little startup company in Shaker Heights, which is you know one of the suburbs of Cleveland. And I got an opportunity to intern for him uh, disassembling virus code and, and figuring out what they did and and uh, essentially uh, designing assembly little widgets and programs to remove and clean viruses. I worked there for maybe a year, year and a half out of out of college the uh, and they got acquired by Symantec so a lot of our stuff actually ended up being migrated into Norton Antivirus so that was kind of my lucky first start. I was, some advisor said hey this guy is doing some interesting stuff in computer security. You should check it out. And I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, but I also am one of the co-organizers uh, of B-Sides Cleveland. Um, I've run my own company for, uh, I ran my own company for close to a decade doing uh, penetration testing, threat assessment, risk, risk analysis. Um, and so having said all of that, disclaimer A, standard stuff, nothing I say represents any of the people uh, that I have worked for or work for currently. Uh, disclaimer B, this isn't a technical talk, this isn't a box popper talk, uh, it's focused on natural security systems. It is absolutely not about Darwinian evolution versus religion. We're talking about adaptative, uh, adaptive systems, um, and I fully expect arguments and, and welcome them, absolutely. I want to start with some generic problems within InfoSec. Right? Security is viewed as a tactical IT function. And, and that ends up being a reactive type uh, system. Um, if you speak at a very high business level or layer within your organization and ask them about security, they're going to probably end up saying something along the lines of, you know, what firewalls have you installed lately? And, and, and that's, that's not really uh, beneficial to the business um, because we really need to, to kind of reset this mindset and, and accept that security is a function of the business, right? Um, and, and, and rational, I, this quote from Edward Deming, who is a kind of an older business anal uh, analyst, uh, rational behavior requires theory, reactive behavior requires only reflex action. We're kind of living that right now in terms of, uh, and I'll kind of hit on it in a little bit, but, but in terms of the way we are reacting to especially all of the, the this giant media frenzy of big breaches, APTs, and all that, right? It, our organizations are reacting to those things as opposed to kind of rationally thinking about what's our business risk, what's the business need. And so this, this talk really is going to focus around how can we as organizations kind of behave and adapt accordingly to this, this, you know, kind of evolving threat landscape. Um, so real, real quickly, and this is my opinion, um, our role really is to prevent the loss of business critical data. And, and one of the, the biggest things in understanding business critical data is having the conversations at those business leader levels to really get a grasp of what is important to the business. What is your business critical data? What are the systems that your organization relies upon for their success? Where do you think that business critical data lives, right? 
Um, that's always a really interesting question when you're, when you're talking to, let's say, a CIO or CEO. Where, where does your business critical data live? Well, um, hmm, I, my IT guys can probably answer that. But it's, it's something that is kind of a, a, a foggy mystery to, to the majority of the organizations that we you know, deal with on a, on a daily basis at a, you know, at a business decision leader level. Um, promoting innovation and allowing businesses to take risk, right? So we're, we're in, the, in the business of reducing and or mitigating risk to the point where it's acceptable to whatever organization's posture, right? So the irony is that we're, um, in reality, we're reducing risk so that organizations can take more risk because without taking risk, Business and organizations can't, they don't innovate, right? And that's, that's where success comes from. That's where, you know, business market leader, leadership comes from. Being able to innovate and, 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 and take all that risk and, and protecting the brand, right? So, so the problems then are <clears throat> understanding these things, right? What are the initiatives? What are the goals? You know, what's, what is that business critical data? Who else might find value in that data? That's a key. Uh, that's a key variable that that um, I don't see talked about very often when we when when we're talking about analyzing a, the the risk to an organization. Right? Who else might find value in that data? What are their capabilities? How much would they be willing to spend to get that business critical data that your business critical data that they find valuable? How much would they invest in that? Is there an is there a clear ROI? If we can, for the adversary, right, if we can design systems with that understanding of their capabilities to the point that there's no real clear ROI, then that's kind of a win. We're no longer low-hanging fruit, right? <clears throat> so this is the standard FUD slide. There's lots of bad things that are going on. We'll just move on. Um, so as a reaction, the reactionary result is businesses are buying a lot of products that are geared towards preventing this latest attack or, or you know, improving these sets of processes because of, you know, this enhanced feature and, and it, it's faster or more, whatever. Um, you know, and, and several other things. Legislation, I'm not going to really touch into, but there there's a point that I do want to make on that is that if you get to the point where a problem becomes so big that you need to try to legislate it, you know, like uh, SOPA or, or any, any other latest attempts, um, you've, you've really missed what was wrong to begin with. And, um, and so that's, that, that's a problem. The, the irony here is that this business and our feeding because of our reactionary um, you know, our reaction to these threats and, and media frenzy is creating an entirely larger, even, you know, more giant uh, industry of those product solutions. So we are part of the problem. What does this talk actually attempt to solve? Well, these two slides here are um, one from Gartner, one from the Verizon DBIR, and I know I said Verizon DBIR, and I don't have a, I don't have a shot, but I apologize. Um, but it, it essentially it essentially illustrates this, right? The IT spend has roughly been increasing over time for the last five years. And for the most part, the breaches have been increasing over the last five years. So we're spending more money on these controls, yet there doesn't seem to be a lot of, of tangible actual results. So... Um, in my opinion, we're probably investing our security dollar in the wrong areas. Um, and yeah, you know, we, if you, if you, if you take a look at people like a David Kennedy or somebody who is really kind of on the cutting edge of, of security research, right? Even he will tell you that from a, from a security technology perspective, we're probably at least two years behind the advancement of, you know, where today's malware, uh, professional business driven malware really are. They're a couple of years ahead of us already. And, and we're, unfortunately, that puts us in that position of, of reacting even further. So the problems here, um, 
you know, the second problem here is we have this obsession with static models, right? Um, the problem with walls. If, if you have a wall that, you know, standard, it's a static control, at some point, water is going to eventually be able to get around it, right? It's not, a, at a, it, it, it's not an adaptive control. And the unfortunate reality is that our reliance on these types of static controls have kind of, we've dug our own hole to a degree, and we really need to kind of figure out how to get out of that. Um, so organizational entropy as the third um, part of this, this, this talk. I, I really love this term. Uh, it's really, really elegant because it, it's essentially organizational entropy is a natural result of assuming you're smarter than your adversaries. And, and let's face it, right? Uh, especially American corporations, there's, there's, there's a kind of a, a large ego in terms of here's how we do things. Here's the way things are done. Um, you know, other companies, here's the way things are done. And because of that kind of inherent, um, you know, that inherent entropy, right, we're falling down into this constant of business as usual. And if we're in this state of business as usual, and especially, you know, here's, here's, the, here's a contrary point, right? A lot of our organizations right now are very profitable. So there's not a lot of incentive to change that. So how can we also... You know, and, and this is one of the big points here. How can we successfully kind of change the way our organizations are reacting, right? We don't want that. We want this, this kind of rational thought. How can we organically change that in such a way that it doesn't directly affect the business revenue bottom line because that's successful and there's no incentive to change that, right? Um, however, that business as usual mentality is directly related to our reliance on static controls and yielding very large breaches right now that are that are you know saturating our media <clears throat> the last one here is the current unnatural state of our business organizations and I just kind of talked through that but yeah this business as usual mentality has resulted in you know this entropy and 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 the organizations are not being creative enough to think of ways to begin adapting to these, you know, more advanced threats coming our way, unfortunately reacting and buying more blinky lights. So these are the four, these are the four issues that, that I want to try to, to discuss through here. Um, and again, you know, can we actually change that successful gross profit, you know, driven business model, um, without telling that whole C-suite that they're doing things wrong? That's the, that's the question I pose, and this is what I feel. I feel that, yes, yes, we has can. Nobody? <laughs> All right. All right, so here's my posit, right? Naturally adaptive systems are inherently more secure, okay? And from, you know, from here within... You know, from here in this talk, I'm going to start kind of breaking down some of the ways that, in nature, organisms adapt, and and there are there are you know several very um, several very concrete um, concrete ways that this is done with within the animal kingdom, so to speak, uh, and and how can we apply that? How can we apply that to our business organizations? Because organisms are kind of very similar to organizations. They're small parts and they cooperate or compete with other parts within here and, and because of that there's cooperation that can grow and, and naturally over time by kind of learning from not our failures but actually our successes. I'll kind of get into that as well. Um, we begin to naturally build more secure natural systems. Um, a couple of or three inspiration slash sources. Um, if nobody's familiar with these books, please take a picture. They're fantastic. Um, Emergence by Stephen Johnson, uh, The Connected Lives of Ants, Brains, Cities, and Software. The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki is a fantastic book about <clears throat> how the collective, uh, the collective reasoning of large groups of very um, dissimilar backgrounds and, and intellects 
when given a challenge, will eventually lead to the best solution. Um, and then learning from the octopus um, is essentially, and I'm going to steal a bunch from this guy as well, uh, who wrote this book, uh, but uh, he, um, he really took it to a next level. The guy that wrote that book is a, a biologist who then went into support, uh, I believe, a senator and from a, a national security perspective. But you know, he's got these really interesting, um, he's got a great interesting biological background and, and applying this to, to how we, um, you know, to how our organizations kind of, you know, move forward and, and has a lot of really interesting ideas. So um, general rules, okay, for systems that are naturally adaptable and therefore inherently more secure, right? Decentralization is a, is a, is a giant variable here. Um, the, the concept of learning from your, from your failure in nature doesn't actually, doesn't actually get you anywhere, right? In nature, if you fail at survival, that's kind of the end of the road, right? Um, learning from your successes is actually more natural and, and, and more reasonable, right? Um, I was able to escape this here, and I was able to find food here, etc. So learning from those successes is actually, in nature, way more important than learning from your failures. Um, information usage to mitigate uncertainty. I'll, I'll, I'll dive into that one, but in information security, uncertainty plays a gigantic role in both offense as well as defense, um, and I'll touch on that. Um, and then symbiotic partnerships, right? So... <clears throat> um, the bottom line here, though, is that successfully naturally adaptive systems do not, um, they don't predict things, they don't plan things out, there are no edicts to do this X, Y, Z. Um, so the first point here in being able to kind of understand how, where we actually sit within this, you know, within this whole kind of um, uh, naturally adaptive system is, this point, right? Adaptation arises from leaving or being forced from your comfort zone, okay? So that really kind of ties into, uh, I would say maybe indirectly, but this reactive mentality that we have of, oh, here's a big threat and, and here's this thing that somebody is saying, this, buy this from us and that will mitigate this big threat. That's not really leaving your comfort zone. That's just, well, here's some money. Um, so, <clears throat> when we talk and move on, um, this concept, th there, there are going to be four um, techniques, so to speak, that um, are details of successful adaptation. Decentralized, decentralization is the first one, right? So, um, multiple sensors, and I'll just pull this out, right? Here's, here are the benefits of decentralized and distributed organizational systems, right? You've got multiple sensors, no preconceived notions, specialized tasks, and redundancy. So multiple sensors, all right? Well, um, a friend of mine gave a really good talk uh, maybe a year or so ago about security awareness. And one of the things that he touched upon in security awareness training programs and whatnot is that if you have, I, I would re much rather have an entire organization full of individually educated and aware persons within my organization rather than relying on a firewall, okay? So the, the, the multiple, having multiple sensors within your organization or within your, let's call it, um, group of organizational uh, variables is, is very, very important. No preconceived notions, right? Having no pre preconceived notions is essentially Nobody say, nobody say, um, you know, saying to anybody within the organization, this is what needs to be done. Or, um, you know, this, this device here needs to be configured this way. Um, what happens is, and, and I'll touch upon this in a little bit more detail, is that the requirement of a challenge within an organization or, or an organism, right, either one, uh, the challenges end up being one of those little sparks that that you know then can 
um, multiple parts of the organization can then say, hey, we have this challenge that, 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 that we need to solve. Let's think about this. Let's collaborate. Let's see if we can collectively find the best way to solve this challenge. And in nature, that's, that's huge. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a little, you know, in, in a couple more minutes in, in more detail. I think I just backed up on that one. Hold on. There we go. Um, specialized tasks, right? So they're within any or within any organism um, slash organization. There are elements that do specific things, and then redundancy. And obviously, in information security, we we all understand the the you know importance of redundancy. So the the second here, and this again, you know, this is a very important point. The second very important point within this talk is that. You know, in order to be successfully adaptive, naturally, you need a challenge, right? There must be some type of challenge to initiate, you know, um, competition, cooperation, etc. cetera. Um, you know, some examples, obviously, from both the you know, animal kingdom as well as technology uh, are here. Um, does anybody, finding a lost nuclear submarine, does anybody know what the USS Scorpion is? Right? Anyone? Nobody? One person? Do you recall what that is? Exactly. All right. So it, it was, the Scorpion was the only um, nuclear submarine the United States has ever lost, and I believe it was 68. Um, so really interesting analogy, and this, this actually came from um, uh, Surowiecki's book, Wisdom of Crowds. He talks about how they kind of went about um, kind of determining where they think that sub went down, right? So they had the last radio transmission. They had roughly the, the area of the last location. Of the last transmission, they had wind direction, you know, current direction, and all that. The director of the Navy at the time, and I forget his name, um, issued a challenge, a challenge to everybody within within you know the Navy or maybe you know an area of the Navy, but that included generals, that included custodians, right? So a very wide sample set of people to kind of you know present this challenge to, and the challenge was, uh, in your estimation, give you know give me the the, your best approximation of where you think this sub is. And so not any one of those answers um, were anywhere near correct when they actually found where the sub went down. But the mean of these hundreds of answers ended up being 224 yards away from the actual location of the sub on the bottom of the sea. That's the wisdom of crowds. <clears throat> That's mind-blowing. That's fantastic. So challenges within any organization are a very critical key component, right? No edicts, challenges. And from a managerial perspective, you know, I, I, hope, I hope if it's not already in your, rep your repertoire, I hope, you know, that this starts to, to kind of sink in. Um, the third technique here, information sharing, filtering, and prioritization, right? So... Um, obviously, you know, we in information security, um, we understand about the sharing of information, the filtering of information, both from an offensive perspective as well as a defensive perspective, and prioritization of that, of that information, right? Prioritization leads directly into access control systems. Who's allowed to, you know, access this type of data or this data should be considered more important in transmission over the wire, et cetera. Um, but at the bottom line here, right, organisms seek to reduce uncertainty for themselves and increase uncertainty for their adversaries, right? Hi, information security, right? That's absolutely what we as InfoSec and risk professionals really are focusing on, right? Honeypots, uh, you know, to, to kind of sleight of hand any type of potential adversary, reduce the, you know, generating uncertainty for a potential attacker that then will give you, let's say, more ample time to detect and react to that particular threat, right? So uncertainty is giant in terms of, um, you know, in, in, when we're talking about information itself and utilizing that information accordingly. The last one here from a successful adaptation technique is symbiosis, right? There's a number of different types of, of symbiosis. 
according to you know the experts, mutualistic, commensual, parasitic. But the bottom line is that organis organisms as well as organizations need to utilize their symbiotic partnerships accordingly and rely on them for certain things. And we do this to a certain degree from an organizational standpoint. Right? We'll outsource this and we'll partner up with this organization here. But even internally to an organization, there are symbiosis between teams and groups and, and things of that nature that need to be um, you know, really kind of stressed and, 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 and utilized. Um, so there we have it, right? The four, uh, the four techniques for successful adaptation for natural organizations, natural organisms and organizations. And again, you know, they, I, I want to stress that when I'm talking about organisms, I'm also talking about organizations. The same rules apply. <clears throat> The third point here, and this is kind of the, the, the third and final major point, um, is this, this whole concept of competition and cooperation. Okay. So individual competition, right? So here's a challenge. Here's a small group of, of individuals and, and, and they are issued a challenge. Within that small group, each of the smaller individuals are now competing with each other initially to come up with a solution for that challenge. That initial competition will, le will lead to cooperation when everybody in that little group realizes and finally kind of like gets that, well, we're all trying to solve the same challenge. So the competition instills cooperation, right? And when then you have cooperation within a small group that then solves a challenge. Another group over here made up of smaller individuals will also see that successful, um, that successful um, challenge met. And then now you have a group of individuals and another group of individuals that for the next challenge, maybe they compete with each other, right? So you go from very small challenges and then cooperation within a small group to then larger challenges and then of competition between groups and then eventually cooperation with the groups and we can build upon that you know we, we can very I'm not going to say easily but that can be built upon and 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 be essentially become a milestone for or not a milestone but you know a, a column of your naturally adaptation technique <clears throat> so, here's the quandary, right? And I, I, I talked about this a little bit, but because of this business as usual mentality and the, you know, successful revenue generation, gross profit for many organizations today, what's the incentive to change? And, and, and there's, from a business leader perspective, probably not a lot of incentive to change. So how can we build naturally secured systems in this environment where, you know, and let's be real, incentivized adversaries? You know, it's a, stealing data is a giant business model. Incentivized adversaries are well ahead of the technology, developing the technology to get our data, then we are developing technology to prevent that data. So in this environment where there's really not a lot of incentive from a business leader perspective to change the organization, then, you know, the, the, the business model, even in the face of giant breaches, anybody know what the, the latest target stock price is at? It's about where it was before the breach. So we have a short memory. And so in the face of all these giant breaches, it's, you know, the, 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 the mentality in, that I'm seeing is that, well, well, we'll get back to where we were. And so this, the incentive to change is low. So how can we build more naturally you know, secured systems in this environment? Aren't we, as humans, very good at adaptation? And yes. Of course we are. Um, the irony, right? The irony is we're exceptionally adaptable in certain circumstances, right? And, and, and those certain circumstances, you know, tend to be 
um, you know, when, uh, when there are challenges and things of that nature, right? Leaving our comfort zone, we're really good at, you know, these adaptative, uh, adaptive techniques. Um, but the irony is that, unfortunately, we've created systems that are inherently non-adaptive um, in our systems and institutions based on this business as usual, we're doing okay, so we don't really need to go out of our comfort zone. And, and that's, that's where the, the, the basis of this inherent challenge lies, right? Um, <clears throat> and and, and at, yeah, at the end of the day, that is, that is the problem with the business as usual mentality. So how can we end up with systems that can deal, I mean, I'm going to step back for, for just a second. One of the most important or critical aspects of any organization from a security perspective is, is the detection and reaction of threats, okay? Lowering or reducing the time that it takes to detect a potential breach and then react to it accordingly is, in my opinion, one of three of the most important things, the other two being data classification and security, real security awareness, right? Not a socks checkbox, right? Um, <clears throat> you're laughing, aren't you? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, you know the um, with those three, right? Um, here are the basics that I, you know, that that I, I feel any organization can grab onto and begin kind of organically making these subtle changes within your organization, right? These don't have to be big top-down changes that is going to alter the business mindset of a CEO, right? These are little things because little things can compete with each other and then introduce cooperation. And we can, in my opinion, like an organism, we can take our organizations and utilize these same sets of techniques to inherently make our businesses more secure without having to spend lots more money in, you know, next generation firewalls or, or, or things of that nature, right? So, so here we go, right? Introducing the challenges, not directives, right? Without challenges, organizations and organisms don't learn. Learning, learning about solving things is, is critical from an adaptation perspective. Amplify and reward your successes. Incentivize everything that you possibly can. Um, you know the, the 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 physical guard at the at your plant who you know um, successfully doesn't plug in a USB stick when uh, when somebody rolls up to the window and says, "Hey, I, I need to give you my resume. You know, can you give this to somebody?" When that happens and your and your guards are like, "No, sir, that's you know I can't." plug your USB, incentivize that, reward that person. You have to incentivize the behavior that ingrains it and everybody thinks about it more, right? <clears throat> Take advantage of local problem solvers, the sharing and distributing of information, you know, that really kind of ties hand in hand with, you know, utilizing the organization's information to either, you know, promote or reduce uncertainty. Um, and promoting the learning, right? Promoting cooperation between between groups, between business systems, between, you know, all of that stuff is, is, is critical. So, you ready? A little IT calisthenics. Who here thinks that these behavioral process, process changes are too radical for your stodgy organization? Raise your hand. Okay. Who here is either in charge of a team regardless of the size or in a position of influence in such a team. Raise your hand. Okay. Who here never raises their hand when asked to raise a hand at a talk? <laughs> Thank you. This is my challenge. This is my challenge to you. <clears throat> Introducing these changes into your small sphere of influence will improve your business unit's metrics, create competition between other units within your organization. That is good. That will lead to cooperation once you realize the goals are the same, leading to group cooperation between business units and business systems. And introduce competition at higher levels. Competition is good. 
Your small successes will lead to larger successes. And in the end, we are building more naturally secured systems. <clears throat> All without telling the CEO he's doing it wrong. Questions? Google. Google's a great example. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah no. Um, so so um, we incentivize security awareness programs left and right. Um, true security awareness programs where we'll do, um, let's say, quarterly um, quarterly training, right? But it's, it's you know, you, you, you have to kind of rely on PowerPoint to a certain degree regardless. But, you know, the quarterly training is, is you know, we break it up. You know, this month it's password management. Using key pass, you know, the, the benefits of two-factor authentication, why passwords are pretty much an archaic thing, right? And then, um, you know, when people on their own begin to, you know, see these, let's say, you know, authentication challenges and then move into applying these types of techniques, you know, that, that's a rewardable and incentivized type of thing, right? Um, when you talk about, um, op, okay, so DevOps, right? DevOps is a great example uh, of where you can apply these, you know, in many different ways. Um, the, the application development, um, ins ensuring that, um, okay, here's the application goal that we want to achieve. Now, group A, run with that and let me, you know, when you have successfully um, completed that challenge of this port, this part of the application, let's take a look at that. Oh, excellent! You've um, you've started development with an understanding of a basic, you know, security uh, framework in terms of the transmission, the storage, etc., that type of data. Um, incentivize that. You know, it, they're really they're, it's everywhere that you can apply this. And very small. Start small, right? Start really small. Did I answer your question? Kind of? Ish? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, I mean, you see, you kind of see the, where I'm kind of, you know, trying, the point that I'm trying to make, right? <laughs> Yes, sir. So what you're saying is that it's business as usual. Well, I mean, getting outside of your personal comfort zone, right? At the end of the day, security is completely subjective to everybody in here, right? And 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 that's because we all have a we all all own our own personal status quo. Okay, what are we willing to invest in X Y Z, right? And so security is inherently subjective. So, so if, if, if this is something that you think you can maybe begin applying, right? So how can you kind of step out of that comfort zone that you're in and begin applying these techniques? I'm not sure I can help you. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. Yep. And different organizations are going to have different thresholds that you're going to need to kind of figure out, right? As to where that, you know, where those lines are. You, unfortunately, may be, you know, being a government employee, I'm assuming, uh, or ish, you know, and maybe at least dealing with that, that may be, that may be right there. And I gotta kinda like, 
you know, step out of my comfort zone here. You know, other organizations, yeah, great. Got all the space over here that I can begin thinking about this. Wolf, did you? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, uh, one of the organizations that I work very closely with, uh, they, um, they routinely go through and um, will crack their own users' passwords, right? They'll, the admins will dump the databases, they'll do, you know, they, they've got their own GPU cracker and, and they'll go through and, and they'll, they'll pop that. Um, occasionally they will still, they'll find some really bad passwords that still fall acceptable, you know, they're acceptable under the, the policies, but for the most part, um, every, you know, the, in that particular organization, department by department, right, they'll go through and say, you know, we're going to do this, let's say, quarterly, and, um, you know, so everybody knows that it's going to happen, and everybody whose password uh, either doesn't get broken or if it does get, you know, broken, if it's still a relatively complex-ish type password, you know, here's a uh, $25 Amazon gift card. Thanks, everybody. Right? It's it, a very simple example, but, you know, it really kind of promotes that, the, the, the behavior, right? Anybody else? Any questions, comments, arguments? I like arguments. Yes, sir. So I would say that at, at a certain point, right, little groups are, you know, in a standard organization, little groups are going to be, let's say, managed by somebody here, right, and then those managers are managed by somebody here. So without understanding the complexity of your actual organization, being able to kind of influence the those kind of decision makers with a challenge, right? Say, so, you know, we've we've been seeing X and we believe that collectively the organization should begin thinking about how we can mitigate X or improve Y, etc. And Again, every organization is going to be different. Every person is going to have a different reaction to that. But being able to, to um, you know, utilize the individual members of the group to kind of emphasize, yeah, that's a really good way to kind of, we should really start thinking about this. And then at a certain, oops, sorry, at a certain point, um, you know, in theory, if I'm not, you know, smoking crack, um, that, you know, at a certain point, that will eventually kind of wind its, that challenge communication will wind its way over to here and, and, and now we've got the IT guys thinking about it and maybe you guys can say, hey, you know, we've been thinking about this too. How can we begin to solve or improve X, Y, Z, etc.? I mean, that's, again, you know, every organization is different, but I've seen that success. Sure. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they want to, they end up doing something that they think is right. They see a potential for a problem, and they try to fix it as fast as possible. And on the flip side, they try to do some kind of one app to decide what the proper size of the group should be to be fixed. As well as just give the answer. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I completely understand where you're coming from. And, and that's an unfortunate business as usual mentality, right? You know, most organiz, a lot of organizations are really siloed. And, you know, this, I had somebody, you know, I, I was, I was kind of putting the bits and pieces of this, of this talk together over this past year. And, and somebody was like, yeah, but, but my organization, you know, it, it has these silos and it's really hard. And, and yeah, I, I get it, you know, so that's where, that's where figuring out what are your limitations of stepping out of that comfort zone come into play. Now, will you specifically be successful? Maybe not, right? I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is worthy of, you know, kind of thinking about within any organization and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of stopping our reliance on, on buying shit, you know? Right. Absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a really great point. You know, if if the relationships don't exist between the, you know the the different business systems within the organization, then yeah, you're going to have a really tough time trying to. I mean, within your sphere of influence, absolutely, and maybe your actions within your sphere of influence, other organizations that have their you know other people that have their own. Um, spheres of influence will see that your successes are yielding really interesting results. Maybe you guys got a bonus and they didn't, right? And so, you know, it's it, it's that symbiotic relationship that then would then theoretically <laughs> emerge. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Who's advocating rational behavior? Stop that immediately. No, that's a great point. And you know, staying staying you know optimistic about all of it, you know, is is a necessary variable in my in my opinion. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I, I probably not. Uh, the question was. Uh, is, is there a reason I use the word rational versus proactive? Um, no, it's probably just um, that word is probably more prevalent in, in the source material versus proactive. I mean, we're in InfoSec. We're we're really you know that's we hear proactive a lot, absolutely. Um, but I would say that, that you know in 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 relation to this talk, you know that's it's an it, it's a interchangeable word. Yes, you can have proactive behavior that is irrational. Thank you. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so he's made my point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for coming, and, uh, and have a great rest of the con. Thanks.